Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mir Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I'm the Director of Communications at Mir. We're so glad to be getting together for another Mir Talk today. We will be hearing from our guest speaker, Steve Keen. Then we'll have a question and discussion period with a few people from the wider community. And after that, we will open it up for some questions from all of you in our audience. So before we begin, I just want to give you a couple of updates on MIR. We are setting up a mirror and cryosphere experiment and are very appreciative of any donations you can make to support the shipping of experimental materials, including mirrors and other devices. I also want to remind you, you can make a monthly donation, and this is a wonderful way to continue to sustain what we are up to. You can go to mirror.org forward slash donate. And thank you so much for those of you who are already doing monthly contribution. Also write to community at mirror.org if you want to be in touch. So I would like to tell you a bit about Steve. Professor Steve Keen is a distinguished research fellow at University College London's Institute for Strategy, Resilience and Security. The author of New Economics, The New Economics, A Manifesto, Debunking Economics, and Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? And one of the few economists to anticipate the global financial crisis of 2008, for which he received a Revere Award from the Real World Economics Review. His main research interests are the complex systems approach to macroeconomics and the economics of climate change. If anyone has any questions while Steve is presenting, you can put them into the chat to Barbara Sneath, and Barbara should be showing up to you as a co-host. So Steve, thank you so much for coming and you can take it away. Just unmute yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation as well. I'm uh, delighted to, I mean, the, the news that I'm sharing has to get out to as many people as possible because it's it's a mystery to most people as to why uh, we haven't done anything serious about climate change. And the mystery is solved once you see what economists have done and said climate change is going to do, which is a complete trivialization of the dangers that we face. Just checking, can you see my, my presentation slide with my cartoon me there? Good. Okay. Let's get going then. So um, I, this is the this is the title of a, a paper of mine, and I've got to say that the title and the abstract are probably the most aggressive things I've ever written uh, in terms of what gets through to a, a referee publication. But it's absolutely vital because the work truly is appallingly bad, and uh, that's my latest book, by the way. And uh, I, I guess as much as you get support, I like support as well from the public and publicly funded. So if people want to help out the work that I'm doing, those are the first two sites there, patreon.com slash profstevekeen and profstevekeen.substack.com are how you can uh, assist me in doing my work. Now, just a personal perspective, first of all, I've been a critic of economics for over 50 years now. I, be, I broke away from the mainstream in 1971, July of 1971, to be precise, when I was slightly over 18 years old. And in that... I haven't done anything academic on climate change until about 2019, or 2017. We're working with Bob Ayers, who's the physicist who's done the most to try to bring energy as, as an active element of economic theory. Uh, we're working with him. I developed a, a way to make a positive contribution by explaining the role of energy in production, which ridiculously hasn't been properly included for the previous quarter of a millennium of, uh, of economics. Um, and this is the paper that I wrote with Bob, uh, which is very brief, just showing how energy has to be included in economic production functions and economists don't include it. And the basic little insight there was the idea that labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. So energy is not an independent input into production. It's an input into the so-called factors of production without which they can do no work. And that's that's the positive uh, contribution I made. Then I thought when I said, okay, I knew I had to criticize what neoclassicals are doing, but it's obviously going to be bad somehow. And I thought I'd need to explain why what's called a Ramsey growth model is just the wrong foundation for modeling the economy. It's what I expected them to use and it is what they use. 
And I thought I'd also be talking about why the high discount rate they use is inappropriate. Those are my expectations before I read the literature. I haven't even bothered getting onto those issues because what really set the scene was they made truly delusional assumptions about what climate change is and then used those delusional assumptions as their empirical data for fitting their models. So it, 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 the models themselves could be brilliant. They'd still be producing garbage because of these garbage assumptions they've made. And without a doubt, it's the worst work I've read in half a century of being probably the world's main critic of neoclassical economics. In, uh, but, you know, there's been a few before me, obviously, but I think I've had the mantle for about 20 years since I wrote Debunking Economics. It is dreadful stuff. It truly is. And you've got to understand that before you realise why there's been so little action on climate change. But they don't deny that it's happening. They deny that it matters. So they're not climate change deniers. They're climate change trivialises. And they've trivialised it by assumption. And I want to show you how they've done it. And to try to understand why they've done it, partly it's the mindset that I've got used to with neoclassical economists. But the number of times I've been in a, uh, in a, a, a staff room and seen a bunch of neoclassical economists having a chat and then they hop and say, if only everybody else understood economics, the world would be a better place. They blame ignorance of economics for all the problems of the, of the of the real world, when in fact it's knowledge of economic theory that's the main problem. So um, that's go. Uh, so in, in effect, they are, they are deniers in the sense of trivializing it. And this is some of the quotes I'll just show you what the literature is like. It's just mind got mind, you know mind-numbing that this stuff is being said by people who are supposed to be experts on climate change. There is Nordhaus in 1991 saying that human societies thrive in a wide variety of climate zones and for the bulk of economic activity, non-climate variables swamp climate considerations in determining economic efficiency. But that's absolutely true and completely irrelevant to climate change. Okay? Why would you put that in a paper? Okay? It shows a, a, a lack of knowledge. And then when you, the conclusion of this article, he said, damage from three degrees of warming is likely to be one quarter of 1% of national income. And his hunch, okay, isn't that a scientific word for a, isn't that a paper you, word you see, in fact, to see in a scientific paper? My hunch is the overall impact is unlikely to be larger than 2% of total output out of a three degree increase in temperature. And then he did a survey of so-called experts, 19 people, 10 of whom were economists. And he said that uh, his, his best, for most, most of them, the best guess was that three degrees of warming would be small potatoes. Now, I'm almost certain the person who's responsible for the small potatoes quote is Larry Summers. Of course, we all know Larry's as expert on the climate. This is also, I think, a Larry quote. It takes a very sharp pencil to see the difference between a world with and without climate change or with and without mitigation. Okay? That's how trivial they think it is. Now, in the same survey, there were three scientists in the 19 people, two of whom answered the questions, one refused to answer the questions, and those two people's estimates were 20 to 30 times higher than what the economists were saying. Uh, but they effectively they drowned them out with the others. And this is the IPCC from 2014. For most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impact of other, other drivers. And of course, this standard thing that the IPCC does is say the evidence and the agreement. Medium evidence, but high agreement. Okay? So as a group, they just believe climate change doesn't matter. And this is how, the, this is how they've proven that they've done it. Yeah. Anyway, so Nordhaus after he got his Nobel Prize, he published a paper in one of the American Economic Review sub-journals where he said there would be a 7.9% fall in GDP for a six-degree temperature rise. Okay, six degrees of temperature. I think everybody, most people who know climate change know that at that, that point, we're talking 95% of the world's mammals extinct, probably including us. Uh, and these are, th I've had a couple of papers or a paper rejected from a journal on the basis of the stuff you're criticizing would never get published today. Well, this is last year. 3.67% uh, fall from a four degree increase in temperature. And notice the precision. They can't even get today's GDP right to one decimal place, but they think they can predict what's going to happen to GDP in 80 years to two decimal places of accuracy. I'm waiting for one of the producers, one with three decimal places. 7.22% fall from a 3.2 degree increase. 
and tipping points reducing consumption by 1.4% of GDP. So if you lose uh, the Arctic, Greenland, anti West Antarctic, the Amazon, the AMOC, uh, the Indian monsoon, the permafrost and ocean methane hydrates, that'll just make things 1.4% worse than if none of them get affected. Yeah. And here's the latest IPCC report. Warming of four degrees by 2100 will reduce GDP by 10 to 23%. Now that's a 10 to 23% reduction in a GDP that expects to be growing compared to where we are right now. So that's saying rather than being four, rather than being five times today's GDP per capita, it'll be four times. And this is why, again, the people who, 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 read, who read this stuff and, and don't know that they shouldn't take it seriously, therefore don't take climate change seriously. Now, Sardis, of course, and Paul uh, Beckwith's done a marvellous job here in his, his own right, have done plenty of warnings of existential risks. So Hansen and all writing back in 2016 about if we lost the uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation in paper examining that, two degrees of global warming could be dangerous. Uh, Stefan and co, significant danger of tipping cascades at two degrees, uh, and Lenton and co saying, again, about two degrees. Kemp just recently saying they'd say three degrees is a marker for extreme climate change. And look at the difference in numbers. Scientists are worrying about the level of one and two degrees. Economists are sanguine about six degrees. So how do they get these low estimates? The basic answer is they make them up with simplifying assumptions that are literally absurd. So here's Nordhaus. Uh, he didn't actually say a roof will protect you from climate change, but the only thing that uh, that these industries have in common uh, that he's lumping together and saying will be unaffected is that they have a roof over them or that they're below ground. Activities such as microprocessor fabrication are taken in carefully controlled environments, and that's true, they are. But he then says... We therefore assume 87% of American GDP will be unaffected by climate change. Now, that is all of manufacturing, all of services, uh, all of wholesale and retail trade. And he then says at some point, it's really hard, difficult to think, find major direct impacts on manufacturing, mining, utilities, finance, trade, and most services over the next 50 to 75. Difficult to find. And the IPCC in 2014, same sort of stuff, agriculture, forestry, fisheries and mining are exposed to the weather and thus vulnerable to climate change. Other service activities such as manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments and not really exposed to climate change. In other words, to be exposed to the climate, you've got to be exposed to the weather. That's their thinking. Now, there's a little uh, uh, recent news article that I found intriguing in this in the circumstance the weather is causing microprocessor plants to shut down in china because they can't get enough water from the rivers to to do the processing so you know maybe there is effect after all in those manufacturing items they also then when they start creating their numbers uh, the, the first one is used to say just less less than 10 percent of the economy when they've carried their logic through will be affected by climate change then they say well, we, we need numbers We've got to fit functions to data here. So let's assume that the relationship we see between GDP and temperature today will apply under climate change. Now they take the they take take into continental United States as the way that they do their analysis. Uh, Florida has less income than America. Uh, North Dakota has less income than, than than New York. North Dakota has less income as well. So there's a polynomial relationship, uh, fairly trivial between temperature and GDP, and then we can predict that in future. That's that's one of the, you know, another absurd assumptions. One that I've just had uh, realised to me, because a lot of the IAMs are proprietary computer code. You've got to read the computer code to know what's going on. But they actually, all their models, all the IAMs, none of them have precipitation in them. They simply have temperature. Okay? They leave out half the weather when they're saying climate change will only affect you if you're exposed to the weather. And this is from a paper, the paper on tipping points, uh, noticing that a, the AMOC slowdown will likely have effects other than just on temperature, but these have yet to be incorporated in economic studies. They've had 30 years. Why the hell haven't they included rainfall in their models of climate? Okay. Um, and then here's Antoff and co, who wrote the paper that uh, the Dietz and co used to talk about the impact of the AMOC. 
saying, oh, often assume other climate variables scale with temperature. What does that mean? They have an ideal temperature in their models, and they presume that if the their statistics say that the globe will move toward, a particular country will move towards that ideal temperature, we also assume it'll move towards ideal rainfall. Well, isn't that a nice assumption? Um, and then the, the latest work that they've been doing now says, well, we know that that idea that temperature and GDP today is a bit of a furphy because you, we don't have any change of temperature going on there. But let's use change in temperature and change in GDP over the last 50 years and extrapolate that forward. This is Khan and Mahadi's. And they say that a, a, a 0.04, 0 a, a 0 one twenty-fifth of a degree increase in temperature per year between now and 2100 will reduce real GDP per capita by 7.22% two degrees of accuracy once more. And what you can see there, the the the, the dots that they've got there are, are the various other uh, forecasts that this lot have made of uh, climate change. Uh, good to see Richard Toll does good proofing here. That was a mistake in the working paper. That's also a mistake in the published paper. But these are the various points they've used. And this is the most extreme of any of the predictions, Birkenall in 2015, saying a four degree increase in temperature would reduce GDP by 23%. But there, well, most of them are clustered up here. And this is the forecast that Khan and Mahadi's made. Now that, as you can tell, is obviously a, a simple linear extrapolation from what's happening now. In other words, nothing gonna happen in the next 80 years that causes any non-linearities in the way that the economy responds to temperature. Give me a break. Um, and, and then also the, the, the crazy one, the one I want to go into in detail in this presentation that I haven't done before, they think they can model tipping points using a quadratic. So here is um, the, the summary of one of the summary points in Dietz and Wagner on tipping points. Uh, tipping points reduce global consumption per capita by around 1% upon three degrees of warming and 1.4% upon twice as much warming, six degrees, based on a second order polynomial fit of the data. And you'll find this all the way through their paper. Um, and then when they look at the, the non-economic uh, non section, so they're talking about environmental uh, side rather than just the economy itself. The catastrophic warming temperature noted that of 17.68 degrees Celsius increase over pre-industrial levels, which I don't think the planet has had since it, since it solidified out of the molten magma, uh, God knows, a, a couple of billion years ago. The assumption that economic losses rise quadratically and are calibrated to a loss of 2% at 2.5 degrees of warming. This is just madness. This is nonsense. Um, so this is what they do. They say that the environment will be intact until such time as temperatures rise by 17.68 degrees. The Holocene environment, obviously, will survive a 17.68 increase in temperature until it's all totally gone. It is just ludicrously bad. So why do they use a quadratic? Well, the basic reason is because they're lazy. Okay? It's what they've done in all the economic modelling. A quadratic makes it easy to do their optimization. Uh, routines, so that that's why they use virtually everything. And they, 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 they believe that, first of all, they believe that you can find global warming data in current data, which itself is a pretty insane assumption, except for the, the very last few years. Yes, okay, we're starting to see major impacts turning up, but, you know, it's, it's, it's where we're starting from trivial, relatively trivial level, 0 0.2 degree increase. They think they can find it in that data as well. Now, they've been attacked on using quadratics for years. So this is Stanton, Ackerman and Carter back in 2009. We can find no rationale, whether empirical or theoretical, for adopting a quadratic form for the damage function. There is none, of course. Uh, Weizmann uh, said that we must be underestimating by using a quadratic. Uh, and Pindic, you know, quite bluntly, as, as blunt as I can be, the damage function is made up of, out of thin air. It's not based on any theory or any data, but this is what they're using. And now let's just see why this matters. What happens when you compare a quadratic to an exponential? I'll do a larger graph than that on the next screen. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what they've done, but I'm gonna fit different functions as well. Um, so what they've done is they've made up their own data. They've actually generated the numbers to which they fitted the data, which itself is morally suspect to begin with. You should be, if you're gonna do data fitting, unless you've got an incredibly uh, well worked out and, uh, you know, ethically 
validated way of getting your data together. If you're, you know, going and taking ice cores from Antarctica, then okay, I will accept you've got a right to fit your data to your function. But not when you're making this stuff out of publicly available data and making the crazy assumption they're doing. So I'm going to use the third party database, not one that I've made up. And I'm going to extrapolate from that data, not just using a quadratic, but also using a, 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 a exponential and a, a logistic function. And it happens, and I didn't find this myself, by the way, one of my colleagues, Brian Hanley, located it, which I'm very grateful to Brian for doing this. The United States Office of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, uh, has a, a billion dollar climate weathers database, which they maintain very, very carefully. And it plots what I'm doing in this graph. They, they show the damages in United US 2015 dollars. Uh, they've also got one without uh, with nominal dollars, but that's the main one they use. So the billion dollars is a billion dollars worth of damages in 2015 dollars. And this is plotting that data uh, against the against the uh, carbon anomaly. So what I've done is I've taken uh, the actual data, which is plotted against years, taken the carbon dioxide data and plotted that against temperature and then mapped across from carbon dioxide at a particular point in time or the date back to the carbon dioxide concentration. So that's that's the chart that I'm going to fit the data to. And when you fit it, there are my three functions, a quadratic, an exponential, and a logistic. Now, who can tell which one is which? Okay. You simply cannot distinguish them from the existing data. So the whole question is what happens when you go further forward in time? Those are the three functions. And I'm very pleased that I managed to get nonlinear regressions working for each of those three. The data was just good enough to enable those regressions to come out. They've all got the same R squared of 0.13. They differ when I go to five or six decimal places, but that's a nonsense that economists do, not me. Let's go on a bit. So now, now let's take a look. Uh, what happens when you look this when you look at this not just for the in data but your out of data? What what's what does your out of data prediction look like? Well, the quadratic says nothing going to be wrong, go wrong until the twenty second century. The exponential and logistics say it's all over sometime this century. That's the difference. So these idiots and pardon me, I'm not going to be polite about them. I think they're fools. This is Nordhaus's quadratic. Okay. 2100, less than 10% damages. This is the quadratic I derived from the data, more substantial, but still in the ballpark of the sort of figures the neoclassicals use. This is what the logistics says. You're not going to have an economy by 2088. And this is the exponential. You're not going to have an economy by 2060. Okay. We've got less than 40 years before capitalism fails. Now, that that is that's what they should have done, but they stick with what they like. So the whole idea that these minimal damages are going to occur are based on economists assuming that minimal damages are going to occur. That's it. Nothing's longer behind them than that. In fact, it's weaker than that. So what you get as a result of that is people in the finance sector who are arrogant enough and uh, to believe they're masters of the universe and foolish enough to believe economists come out and say things like this. Why investors need not worry about climate risk. Now, this is Stuart Kirk. You may have heard of him. He made a speech at ACPC, which got him sacked from HSBC. But fortunately, he's picked up by a charity called the Financial Times, who's now a common columnist for the Financial Times. That's really helpful, isn't it? They said the first argument they give, which is talking about people who are saying climate matters, is it's going to hit future growth. And the IPC is going to hit GDP in 2100, and their worst case model lop off 5%. That was actually true of the uh, 2014 report. What they failed to tell you, of course, between now and 2100, the economies are going to grow a lot. Uh, the world's going to be 500 to 100 richer, if I can actually repeat the tone with which he said that in his speech, which you can find on YouTube. If you lop off 5% of that, who cares? You'll never even notice. And that's the mentality that dominates how we're thinking about climate change. Now, of course, people in this audience who know what scientists are talking about uh, know that what scientists are saying has got nothing to do with trivial optimizations and so on. It's an existential risk. And it's not doomism, but realism to say this is what we face if we don't radically reduce the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
or counter it. And this is from Stefan and Co in 2018, the argument being that we have lived on this limit cycle, uh, which has been going on and off for the last 800,000 years during the, the pre-Holocene temperatures. And then what we've done is push ourselves over this way. And if we go past various tipping points, we could find those all pushing us into a hothouse earth, which would be unlivable. We've got to make the journey over here. And that's that, that's the focus that scientists have is what we should all be attempting to do. So then why do economists make these crazy assumptions? Why on earth do they think it's sane to assume that a roof will protect you from climate change? Well, it comes out of because of the methodological uh, nonsense that economists have swallowed, which comes from Milton Friedman, actually in a paper he wrote back in the year I was born, 1953. Uh, and he argued that you can't test a theory on its assumptions. In fact, I argue this uh, paradoxical case that the more significant a theory is, the more unrealistic its assumptions will be. Now, that's nonsense, academically. Okay, but the reason they swallowed it is because they kept on running into empirical contradictions of their theories and logical contradictions in their theories. And this was saying, don't worry about them; they don't matter. Uh, you can only test a theory by its results, by what it actually says, whether the results fit the data. And you can't test on the assumptions, so don't worry about the assumptions. In fact, the crazier assumption is, the better your theory is going to be. And that's pretty much described what economists have done ever since. Uh, if you if you make assumptions that put that you then other uh, disciplines would have you put inside a padded cell, we'll give you the Nobel Prize for economics. Now, well, they they use these assumptions to avoid logical and empirical criticisms when those absurd assumptions support neoclassical theory. If you make an assumption that contradicts the theory, they reject your paper on referee. And I call this the neoclassical disease. I go into it a bit of detail in the in my latest book. Um, but this, so this, this, this belief combined with the initial position where they see capitalism as the most flexible social system ever, uh, they just don't think climate change could be an existential threat. And they put the numbers together to justify that conclusion that they started with. Now, if I want to see where the key sort of the delusion comes from, it's failing to understand the role of energy in production. And that comes back to my own positive contribution here. So most economic models use what they call the Cobb-Douglas production function. And that's, uh, I'm going to go some mathematics here. So my apologies for the mathematic, but I think it's necessary here. But there's GDP, which I use the letter Y for. This is supposed to be technology, the letter A, growing over time. This is the amount of labor employed, the number of workers, and this is the capital, effectively the number of machines. Now, the alpha there uh, is based on the share of GDP. So because capitalists get about 30% of GDP, they get the value of alpha of, of, one, of 0 0.3, and that means the exponent for labor is 0 0.7. Now, energy is ignored. There's no role for energy in that. And that's why that's stupid comment. And not, frankly, let's not be polite to these people. That's stupid. Okay. It's literally stupid. I don't care if you've got a Nobel Prize for it. It's stupid. Uh, difficult to find major impacts. Well, that's because there's no role for energy there. And when they bring energy in, what they do is they add it in as the third factor of production. So rather than A and L and K, they've got A and L and K and E. And they treat E the same way. They use an exponent for E, which is based on the share of energy in production. And it's about 3 to 4% of GDP is energy. So this is a particular researcher used the, uh, the value of 0 0.3. Now, what that means is when you feed that into the production system, you say, well, what happens if we have a fall in the amount of energy that is available for production? The answer is that a, an 80% fall in energy availability would cause a 5% fall in GDP. So here's your energy input, that 80% less than you had beforehand. There's your amount of your fall. You go from 100% to 95%, trivial. Okay, And that's when they include energy. And, of course, most of the time they don't. Now, this is there's a recent working paper, which I found quite a bit of. The, whenever I, I find I've got to say neoclassicals would hypothetically say this, one of them is stupid enough to go and say it. So I can quote them after that. So that's what I'm doing here. So this is a paper saying, what happens if Russia has a 10% fall in its energy from, uh, if Germany gets a 10% fall in the energy available for Russia? Well, the worst they could manufacture, and this is by using an elaboration of the Cobb-Douglas production function called the CES production function or constant elasticity of substitution, 10% energy stock, 1.5% fall in GDP. Uh, and the, and 
in the extreme their version of the theory, the Cobb-Douglas production function, as I showed you, 10% fall would cause a 0.3 or 0.4 decline in energy. Now, the theory that I'm associated with, what's called post-Keynesian economics, uses what's called the Leontief production function. And that fundamentally says 10% fall in energy, 10% fall in GDP. So uh, Backman and friends put this chart together, and this is showing the amount of energy compared to, this is one where you've got 100% of your current energy. This is a 10% fall to 90% of your current energy levels. And the top line there is the neoclassical minimum, the one that comes out of the Cobb-Douglas production function. And that's saying 10% fall in energy, 0.4% fall in GDP, otherwise trivial. The best they could get it to was 1.5%. That's the one he quoted in the paper. And here's what the post keynesian predict. Now, how did he rank the three? Well, they said, well, you don't need to worry about the, um, uh, this is in a paper an article in Vox, just very recently, as you can see. Uh, substitution and reallocation would keep the losses below 3% of GDP. If you don't have energy, you just substitute labour. And then this is the disparaging attitude they have towards people actually worrying about energy. Public fear mongering does not hold up to academic standards. Well, unfortunately, yes, these are neoclassical academic standards. So let's just take a, a deeper dive into how he got that result. So he, he rejected the possibility of the post-Keynesian one-for-one -one relationship using this logic said, if factor markets are competitive, okay, so there's no unions and there's no large manufacturers controlling uh, wage setting, and then therefore factor prices will equal marginal products, which is part of neoclassical theory. That therefore implies the price of energy would jump to one over alpha, so the price of energy would go to 40, uh, because alpha is 0.04, the price of energy would go to 25 in this hypothetical units, and the price of other inputs, labour and capital, falls to zero. Um, and he said, well, that just doesn't happen. That's nonsensical. But he's right. That's nonsensical. But the thing is, the relationship is one for one. When you take a look at change in energy and change in GDP at the uh, global level, the correlation coefficient is 0.83, and the change is the one for one. So here is data from the World Bank uh, on... GDP and global, uh, what they call gross world product, GWP, and from the OECD and the energy consumption. And they're the same scale, virtually, and almost the same value. So this is this is the actual relation. It is one for one. What that means is neoclassical theory is wrong. We've given a way to disprove neoclassical theory. And I love this quote from, I think it's from, I've forgotten the actual author, Huxley, I think. Uh, the great tragedy of science, a beautiful theory destroyed by an ugly fact. Well, the ugly fact is energy is essential for production, whether that's manufacturing under a roof or agriculture in the open. Less energy means less GDP. So this is just to show you the same logic again, and I want to go to a bit more detail here. This is output in this. It's a, it's a single scale, so effectively they're like a, a uniform commodity we call a widget. Uh, there's your technology, there's your labour, there's your capital. Now, uh, the exponent sum to one, and that's a given the way that they put the theory together, that's a reasonable assumption because with exponent summing to one, if you double all inputs, you double output, and that's reasonable, double the scale. Uh, but the value they give them, that's where the, the dodgy bit comes in, are based on income shares, and that's where they assume that the exponents are equal to the marginal products of the, of the inputs. So the exponent for labour is 0.7 and that for capital is 0.3. And then the same energy 0.03 over 04. Now, um, they use, they said, 0.03 most of the time. When they bring energy, they treat it as third independent factor. So that's, then I've got beta there. And they use that, that, that based on the expenditure share, which is 3 to 5% of GDP. So what Backman used was 0.04. Now, it's not the right way to put it together. This is why mathematics matters because uh, there's a lazy mathematics that they have done. So they've got output as a function of technology times labour times capital times energy. But there's really energy as an input to labour and energy as an input to machinery. So I'm going to treat LE, which is my what I've explained produced by here, is the number of workers and the number of machines over here, and that's the units of each, times the energy consumption of labour, and the energy consumption of machinery, and that's in you know joules or watts or whatever 
amusing, and how efficiently that work has turned into production, EL and EK, uh, which is the conversion of that energy into useful work. Now, uh, when you look at what humans do, we get an enormous amount of energy. I mean, imagine there'd be nobody in this room is using less than three kilowatts right now, probably. Okay? But the amount of energy you put into production, is, if you put more than 100 watts in, you'll be exhausted after four hours. And so most of the audience would be dead after four hours. So the maximum amount of energy you can put is about 100 watts, uh, whereas the energy into machinery has grown literally hyper exponentially. Uh, so that's where the most of the most of the wealth we come from is in what um, I think it was. Um, uh, I've got the name of the person who brought it together. Energy slaves. Okay, Buckminster Fuller's term. It's energy slaves who are doing most of the work in capitalism, not us. Now, when you rearrange the equation, I'm leaving A out because it's superfluous. A bit more rearranging, a bit more still. This is saying output is a constant reflecting the energy input of labour times the energy in machinery times how efficiently it's converted into work raised to the power of alpha times the Cobb-Douglas production function. That's what neoclassicals normally work on. So what's happened is the, by just simply putting energy in as an input to labour and capital, I changed the exponent from the trivial one they use, one which is about 10 times as high. Okay. So that's the first That's the first stage of their mistake. So rather than getting his uh, to point zero four change, I'm now getting three... Uh, you're getting a 0.4% a, a change from a 10% fall in energy. I'm now getting a 3%, but that's not enough to fit the data. And the reason here is that the, the, the exponents they use look like they fit the data, but they fit the data because they are the data. Okay, What they're t doing is, in the Cobb-Douglas production function, is a beautiful paper by Anwar Sheikh showing that production function is simply a nonlinear transformation of the identity that income equals wages plus profits. If you have fairly stable income shares, then you can you'll find that you can actually derive the cobb likers production function from income equals wages plus profits. Well, if you fit that to your national data, of course you're going to good, get a good fit. You're fitting the data to the data. Your correlation coefficient is likely to be one and completely irrelevant. But ManQ, and I've got to say this is one of the few times I've ever praised a neoclassical economist, Greg ManQ, who writes the dominant textbook for first year, did a beautiful piece of work trying to fit the cobb locus production function to international data. And he realised the only way he could do it was by having a share for capital, not at 0.3, but 0.8. Okay? So that means that's 20 times the number that neoclassical is using. Um, so that then says a 10% fall in energy, 8% fall in GDP. But even that's not enough because you look at the data and here's the data um, in, I'll, I'll show you how, it works. The, the, why do the post Keynesians get it right, even though they don't explicitly include energy in their thinking? It's because they've got this empirical regularity, first noticed by Vasily Leontiev, that the ratio of output to capital tended to be a fixed ratio of about three. Okay, so capital is measured was measured about three times what GDP was measured, and that's what the V is. That that's divided by three. And I've got utility capacity utilization there as well. So you start from this expression and say that capital is actually the number of machines times the energy times the efficiency. Here's your standard uh, function, but I'm now dividing it by the energy going into machinery. Uh, so there's your widgets. There's your energy per widget. I right put in energy terms. That's the energy per widget there. And when I do this, I find this EK, which is the efficiency, that is becomes the inverse of V. So an energy rare version of the Leontia production function is output equals capacity utilization times capital times how efficiently machine returns energy into useful work. And that's why the Leontia thing actually fits the data, whereas the neoclassical is completely wrong. So a realistic economics would never have made the mistake that the neoclassicals have done. This set them up for all the folly that they've been involved in since then. Now, uh, just to just, I'm going to I'll go through this fairly quickly because it's I can leave people to read this one through at their own um, pleasure. I'd rather leave some more time for the discussion here. So he did a bit of mathematics there. He even got his got his numbers wrong. He used 0.025, but it should have been 0 0.04. That's where he worked out out the the case that of a of 0.4 percent fall in GDP for a 10 percent fall in energy. And this is, I find it amusing how 
neoclassicals confront the real world. Intuitively, the Leontief assumption means energy is an extreme bottleneck production. Of course, it's an extreme bottleneck. You can't produce anything without energy, but that's not something that economists are generally aware of. So uh, that's again, back to my quote, labor of that energy is a corpse, capital of that energy is a sculpture. So that's the mathematical form that I show. And that's why I say, again, it's important to know the mathematics. Mathematics is not the enemy of critics of economics. It's the ally because economists use mathematics so very badly and we've got to take it apart for them. So when you look at it properly, you find this strong linear relationship. And this is the data. Uh, again, the World Bank data on the bottom, the uh, uh, OECD data on the vertical, actually, Sorry, the other way around. Energy data on the bottom, GDP data on the vertical. You can't get a, a closer linear relationship than that. It's just ridiculous. And that's from 1960 to 2000, or 1980, so 1970 to 2017. So, and here's the change in data. Correlation coefficient 0.83. It's ludicrously strong. Okay. But this, this is the real world. Um, so what you get out of it, is that you can say that you can build a model involving capacity utilization, machines as measured, efficiency of conversion, and you get a cyclical model coming out of it from which you can have an economic breakdown. So I'll just quickly illustrate this. Uh, the neoclassical often think you've got to make their assumptions to be able to model. No, you don't. I'll show you can actually model the economy starting straight from strictly true economic definitions and then expanding terms and so on. And what I get out of this and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll talk about this later if people wish to discuss it. You can model the cyclical breakdown of capitalism as you run out of resources, a breakdown as you have pollution affecting production capability. This is, this is feasible to do alternative modeling to what the neoclassicals have done. Now, of course, they haven't done that. And they've, what they've really done is delayed for 50 years any action on climate change. And the individual who's most responsible in economics for denigrating the limits to growth was William Nordhaus. So the, his fingerprints are all over the inability of human humanity to address climate change. And we're going to find how just how deadly that is, I think, in the next decade. So what we really need economists to do is to work on how to finance the massive scale of energy conversion we need. And that's where what's now called modern monetary theory becomes relevant because the government does not borrow from the public. Okay? The whole idea the government goes into debt has been is simply wrong. Um, you and the idea of people not being willing to buy the bonds because of uh, being unsure about the government uh, that's turning down a free lunch when you when you look at what is done with bond sales the bond sales are purchased using money generated by the deficit itself and the bond sales let them go from low income earning reserves to higher income earning bonds the banks are going to buy that no matter what so this is just this is a software package i've invented called minsky where i let this sort of stuff get get modeled and you can find this government spending, as well as it increasing our, our bank deposits, we have no money in our banks, also increases reserves. And the gap between spending and tax is what creates, uh, enables deficit spending to occur. That also creates the reserves, which the banks then use to buy bonds. And when the banks sell bonds to the public, it reduces the amount of money in circulation. So this is the, the real world. We can finance this stuff. It's how we finance the Second World War. And we have to think the same way. We need a wartime level. The government can create the money to finance projects like me, and that's what they should do. And that we need to work towards where they, where they start doing that. Uh, and you can find this actually in papers written way back after the Second World War, um, that, that when the chairman of the New York Fed said taxes for revenue are obsolete. So the obsession with taxation and bond sales and so on is just wrong. Okay, we learned it after the Second World War. We unlearned it courtesy of economics. We've got to relearn that one. Now, I think also degrowth is going to be inevitable. Back to this chart again. Uh, with, if we're going to force to go in the opposite direction, then GDP is going to decline. It's going to happen one way or the other. Okay? We simply have to do it if we can in the way that causes the least social disruption. But I have very little faith that we'll achieve that. So long before we get to four degrees, let alone six, as Nordhaus said, uh, we're going to be driven to have less energy consumption, um, even if it wasn't forced by a shortage of energy because of the overreach we've done. And we don't need to find a way to put the burden of adjustment on the rich rather than the poor. So I'm working with the guy called Adam Hardy, and Adam might well be in the audience here, uh, to drive, develop the idea of a parallel currency scheme, which could initially start um, 
at a level of, of carbon consumption equivalent to what we do per capita in each major economy today, and but then morph into a into a rationing scheme over time. So the ecocore.org has the proposal, and I'd recommend people check that out. Um, but it's politically impossible to bring this in before people realise the scale of what's going to go on. So I'm actually a supporter of the introduction of central bank digital currencies, not because I want to have central bank digital currencies, but because I think that's a framework that could enable carbon rationing at some point, and we will need rationing for the future. Um, and then we could also uh, have huge transfers to the poor via the government deficit. But again, the mainstream economists are a barrier to that happening. They will prevent this. Um, so can we transition to 100% renewables? That's where I'm getting I'm getting out of my uh, comfort zone in terms of my own knowledge. But I'm going off, especially by Simon Meitschow, who's a, a mining engineer, who argued that the amount of capacity needed to replace what we currently get from fossil fuels is just inconceivable. Uh, so he says you need we need 800 new nuclear power stations and 12,000 hydro and 63,000 wind farm, blah, 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 at the current scale. I'll note that it has been disputed, okay? His scale, there's arguments that he's overstated the need for batteries, and that's where a large part of his uh, argument comes from. But this is the sort of stuff we need to know. What is the capacity we have now for going across to uh, renewable energy sources? Those are the sorts of serious questions we need to be asking. And economists should be the ones providing that answer, but they can't because their model is ethereal. They don't have any real link with the physical world. Um, so the whole idea that we can actually get there as well and that there's no possibility of running out of resources uh, is, is just nonsense because when you take a look at the periodic table, uh, there are, this is from a European Union study, a large number of the elements here are already in shortage. So helium, zinc, uh, I think that's that's silver, and nemidium are already in short supply. Uh, the one that I find most bizarre is phosphorus, but already running into absence of phosphorus. And there's no substitute for phosphorus. This is the crazy thing. You don't have phosphorus, you haven't got muscles. Okay, Or well, your muscles can't activate. And there's other elements as well, which are all looking like they're dodgy for the near future. We have to be looking at this and saying, what are the physical capabilities for us to go to a different production system, not using fossil fuels, but obviously using more minerals? Is that feasible? Now, economists should be answering that question, but they simply can't do it. And this is, again, the idea of a, the universal carbon credit, just to the idea would be to use central bank digital currencies, distribute universal carbon credits at an identical rate per person. And you could set it initially at the average carbon consumption for a country and then have two prices. Everything has a money price and a carbon price. Uh, you have to pay both. Of course, 95% of the population, if they got the average, would never exhaust their carbon credits, but the 5% would, and certainly the 1%, and they would have to buy carbon credits off the poor. And this is politically obviously desirable because 95% of the population would benefit. Whereas normally when you talk about carbon taxation or pricing higher prices for, for carbon products, as Macron tried in France three or four years ago, it hits the poor and they revolt and we can't afford that. So you'd have a, this would be a scheme which would uh, be popular with the majority because it would benefit the majority financially when it first came in and redistribute income from the rich to the poor and put pressure on the rich and corporations to reduce carbon intensity. So again, go to Eco Quarter to see that proposal. And government finance will also be vital. So we have to understand you know, the, the, modern, the way that governments create money because when you've got to reduce profit, reduce output and reduce it drastically, very few corporations are going to make a profit in a world of falling falling demand. Uh, so you have to finance investment despite a decline in global output. And the only government organization that can do that, as we saw in the Second World War, is the government. Now, just a few little points to finish on here. I actually want to find a better data series so I can show how ridiculously stable the Holocene was. But the whole idea that there's, you know, climate's always been changing. We've lived through one of the most stable climate periods in the climate in history. And that's what enabled us to build our sedentary civilization. We only evolved about 300,000 years ago. There's only been one peak in the Milakovitch cycles in that time, apart from the most recent 130,000 years ago. 
We didn't develop the technology then. We did develop a technological society 12,000 years ago on another peak. So because the natural cycle was rising and then falling, we got a period of relative stability. And that's what we haven't got into our mindset, that the stability we've taken for granted is a turning point in a natural cycle. We've destroyed the natural cycle. And that's what climate skeptics often bring in as well. But that's what gave us this stable society. And that's what economists don't understand. The stability, the lack of change in climate is what enables to build our industrial civilizations in the first place. And if that stability goes, then so does our sedentary agricultural industrial civilization. And that's what I fear we're going to face. Uh, and also this, I mean, this the other, the other mistaken climate for weather happens all the time. Uh, that's why I like pointing to some of the more unique contributions in the climate uh, research uh, about what could happen. For example, we have three circulation cells, the, the hydrotherapia and the polar cell. That's why the tropics are warm, the middle latitudes are, are mild, and the pole is freezing. Now, if we break down to one, we get what's called the equable Earth pattern, when the, the, the whole planet is hot, uh, and you have rising air at the equator and falling at the poles, and in the middle you get deserts. And that's the sort of thing we face. The scariest thing I've seen is work by uh, James Anderson, professor of chemistry at Harvard University. So obviously a nutcase. Okay? And the person who discovered the hole in the ozone layer and led the campaign to, to close the hole successfully. His work implies we're going to get a breakdown in the ozone layer, which would make the northern hemisphere uninhabitable. Okay, And that's his saying could happen by 2050. But those are the sorts of dangers we face. We simply have to avoid them. Um, and what capitalists, what neoclassical done, and I find this ironic, but the typical irony when you have a, a religious sect dominating the society, and our religious sect is economics, okay? Uh, they're trying to prevent the criticism of unfettered capitalism. They're going to set up the destruction of capitalism. Okay. We've got to sideline them, get out of the equation before that happens. And uh, finish on a somewhat of a humor, humorous note, they're framing what is an existential risk as a minor cost-benefit exercise. And politicians have believed them, but nature doesn't care. Okay? So we're going to have far greater damages coming far sooner than they talk about, and we're utterly unprepared for what we face, which is why I think MIR is necessary. Uh, people say we shouldn't do bio geoengineering. We are already geoengineering, just in an uncontrolled fashion. This will be an attempt to go in the reverse direction. Now, of course, it will have side effects. But I think those side effects have to be compared not to where we are now, but to the complete collapse of our civilization. And I don't think any of the side effects could come up to the scale of what's going to happen if we don't find a way to reduce the temperature of the planet as soon as we can. And I'll finish with an ad. If you like what I'm doing, please help me do it on Substack or um, on, on Patreon. Uh, let's go and find the stop share button here. Okay, I'm Thank done. You. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the thorough, you know, the thorough amount of information. And just a reminder that we do have a YouTube channel that this will be going on to if you'd like to revisit that because there was indeed a lot there. So next we're going to bring on a couple of people from the community who will ask you uh, I think a question each, and I'll just introduce them first. So Robert Tulip worked in international development for the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and for the Australian Agency for International Development for three decades until 2017, and now convenes the Planetary Restoration Action Group. He has a master's of arts honors degree from Macquarie University, for a philosophy thesis on the, P the place of ethics in Heidegger's ontology and a BA honors also from Macquarie and also a graduate diploma in foreign affairs and trade from Monash University. His website is rtulip.net. Thanks for coming, Robert. We also have Raya Salter. Raya Salter is an attorney, consultant, 
educator and clean energy law and policy expert with a focus on energy and climate justice. Raya is the founder of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center and a member of the New York State Climate Action Council, the body that is developing the plan to implement the nation's leading climate law, the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the state origin of the federal Justice 40, Environmental Justice Initiative, and their website is riasalter.com. Thanks for coming, Raya. And lastly, Paul Beckwith. Paul is a physicist, engineer, and part-time professor at the University of Ottawa, who has been frequently called upon by fellow educators, activists, and concerned persons in the public and government to speak on climate change on podcasts, video, and other interview formats at conferences and events. He's also interest, interested in investment and startups in climate solutions and renewable energy. You might not know this about Paul. Paul is an avid chess player and once attained a ranking of 41st in all of Canada. So his website is paulbeckwith.net. So thank you all for coming. And maybe Robert, we will start with you with your question. All right. Uh, look, uh, thank you very much, Steve. I think uh, debunking the um, assumptions that inform the IPCC is uh, is a really uh, critical uh, and, and essential task today. And it, it illustrates that uh, climate policy needs to be based on facts rather than wishful thinking. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the uh, uh, the scale of the failure of the IPCC is um, really quite unbelievable. And part of part of the issue goes to the uh, the discussion that you raised about uh, what would be needed to transform the energy system and uh, how people make their assumptions based on what's emotionally and politically comfortable comforting for them rather than based on on data and and one of the findings of mia is that uh, we can use a concept that uh, yay tao has called uh, cooling return on investment and and when we when we look at the impact of varying investments on how much they cool the planet, that is uh, mm -hmm. the radiative forcing uh, uh, effect, we find that uh, that measures to change the energy system and uh, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and cut our emissions have a very small effect compared to policies like the mere approach of, uh, of just reflecting sunlight back to space. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, it suggests that uh, rather than looking for uh, net zero emissions, uh, we ought to set a climate goal of net zero heating and uh, just looking at stabilizing the Earth system as uh, as a first uh, objective. So um, I, I just really wanted to uh, to start off by adding in those comments and uh, and just see if, if anything in, in that, uh, uh, like how do you feel about that, that sort of uh, uh, recognition of radiative forcing as, uh, I, as a key, yeah. uh, key issue? I, I think it's essential because we're not gonna do anything until after it becomes obvious there's a huge crisis and the governments are not going to fund anything on scale before then either though. I'd suggest Mia do its best to try to get the ear of the Biden administration and other administrations to get some money put towards you so you can actually start getting ready to roll this stuff out at scale because we'll need to roll that out at scale in a panic. Okay. This is, if you would use the World War II analogy, this is not after the fall of Poland, this is after the fall of London. So that's when I think we're going to do something and we need to get it rapidly. Uh, and so that's, I think, absolutely vital to be prepared as you're doing to be able to roll out this thing, which will reduce the heat directly. And I, you know, I completely agree. All the carbon capture and you know sequestration and stuff is all is wishful thinking applied to technology, as applied as opposed to applied to economic theory. 
Uh, it, it'll take ages. It's, this return is really low, as you say. The scale, the technology is still undeveloped. Mirrors <laughs> have been around for how long? Two and a half thousand years. So in, in that sense, and the fact we can great make the mirrors out of waste material as well, it's a very, very sensible concept. Uh, but I think what you have to be careful with is don't let the, we, we have to do it in the context, you said, once we start doing it, uh, fossil fuels are on the way out as fast as possible. The last thing you wanted to have the fossil fuel kind of so we can balance fossil fuel pollution with more mirrors. So I think that you, you have to be ready to be absolutely politically hardball on this. It, it'll, you, you'll only get massive support for something like me after we get a crisis of a scale that makes even climate denialists like Richard Toll shut up. And that would be you know, not losing a, a, a town in Canada, that'd be losing a, a province of Canada or a, you know, a, a country in Europe on something on a huge, huge, whether it's a, a global famine or it's a, a, a catastrophic storms, et cetera, et cetera, something which is so big, nobody can deny it's climate caused. And then you'll get the attention. Uh, but I said, in that situation, you'd be ready to fight the fossil fuels. So we're thinking, probably starting to think the same thing. I think the fossil fuel people aren't quite as delusional as the economists. But they're probably preparing themselves to say, let's see, we, oh, if, if there's you know, things like me, let's see, we can balance me to continue business as usual. No way. You've got to become the politically dominant force in this. Or at the moment, they're the politically dominant force. Great. Um, Raya, would you like to ask something um sure i want to say thank you this presentation has been so interesting it's a, as somebody who was in economics undergraduate it, starting you know dating myself in 1990 you know nordhaus was the our you know intro 101 textbook you know and so i just mm. i think it's you know it's just really valuable to sort of question you know these underpinnings of how we've learned about economics so i want to thank mm. you and say that's really helpful um it's just, I found your presentation so, just so interesting. I could have a million questions, but the one that I'll focus on, as my intro mentioned, you know, I'm in New York State, in the United States of America, and we are very much having this examination of how we can transform our economy, reduce fossil fuels, albeit we're using a net zero 2050 target that, you know, I don't claim to, you know, agree with net zero, but we are, you know, trying to reckon and reason with you know, the challenges um, of emissions economy wide, but in particular in the fossil fuel sector. And, you know, these, these idea of these techno fixes, carbon capture, you know, and sequestration, carbon capture storage, blue hydrogen, renewable natural mm -hmm. gas, you know, we that are completely non-economic, as you mentioned, completely non-economic, you know, compared to some of the ideas that are discussed more broadly here. Um, and the reason that they are in the story is because of the fossil fuel lobby. Mm. Um, and I just, I say all that because I, and I also, it's it's sort of astounding because you talk about what, you know, energy economists, you know, I think have long understood, you know, how, you know, energy production and economic growth, you know, in an exponential way, you know, has, has been, you know, very much, you know, married together. Yet mm. what I'm hearing you present is that the, is it I, this is getting to my question that it's really the the more elite you know highly regarded prize winning neoclassical authors who are i don't know winning the day here like what is what are these influences that are making it so you know these economists are you know with these is it just a lack of sophistication in their theory and is it elitism is it you know economic contributions i guess my question boils down to why the heck is this why the heck is this happening that seems I agree. Like contrary yeah. to common sense it is it is i mean it, it's there's a i think it was the uh the, the american satirist mentioned who you made the phrase about to every human problem there's a simple solution that is neat plausible and wrong <laughs> and that pretty much summarizes neoclassical economics it's neat it's plausible and it's wrong uh but what it does is it gives you a when, when you've done, having done what you've done in an economics degree, you've got this nice little, you know, consumers are maximizing the utility, firms are maximizing their profits, the market balances one against the other, you get equilibrium, uh, you get, you know, you get, try to get uh, a price equal to 
uh, where supply meets demand, so you have no dead weight loss, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> that was exactly okay. it. <laughs> okay, yeah. And, and it's all it all sounds so neat and plausible. And what it turns, it turns people into zealots because it describes a perfect society. Okay? Because it's a meritocracy. You, your wage is what you deserve. If you're a capitalist, your profit is what you deserve. Okay? Uh, everything's in equilibrium. And obviously being in a state of rest is far preferable to being doing anything active. I often use the use the sex analogy there, you know, standing still next to each other is better than moving. Um, it, it is all these things become part of their ideology. And they 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 believe they're going to make the world a better place. They make it look more like the textbooks. Now, at the same time, you find people trying to drill down into the textbooks and find whether the logic holds up. And universally, in every case where that's being done, they find the logic does not hold up. So you can't derive a downward sloping demand curve unless not only are all consumers identical, but all goods are identical. Then you can get a downward sloping demand curve, but why bother? There's only one commodity. Okay? Uh, that's called the Sonnenschein mantle de Broeck conditions. When they try to prove the stability of prices in equilibrium, mathematicians upset the apple cup. I have what's called the uh, uh, peron Frevenius theorem that showed that the process they thought led to a stable equilibrium was actually unstable and wouldn't reach there. So they make all these assumptions to get over those logical conundrums or empirical contradictions. For example, marginal cost falls. When you do empirical research, marginal cost falls, it doesn't rise, which is the opposite of what the textbooks teach. My favourite example is by Alan Blinder, not, not Nordhaus in this case, but Alan Blinder. He did a brilliant survey mm -hmm. to find out why prices were sticky. This is back in the 1990s. He then found that marginal cost was constant or falling for 89% of the firms he surveyed. What does he have in his textbook? He doesn't even mention his own research. Okay. He just says the same old shit. Pardon me, that's what it is on, on diminishing marginal productivity, therefore rising marginal cost. So what you get is this very protective group that has a vision of a perfect society and doesn't want to hear all these contradictions. And therefore they go out with this zealot attitude. And really, fundamentally, they're religious zealots. They're not scientists in any stretch of imagination. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's sustained, because if you ask, why do Scientologists believe this nonsense? It's because they're Scientologists. And they call us zealots when we say, let's talk about degrowth. Let's talk about... Exactly, exactly. The growth capital. I mean, I'm, I'll give my favourite little... I've, I've been you know, 50 years as a critic, as I said, and on one occasion I was running seminars between businesses and unions on economic issues, and I set up a member of the... Uh, an economist to be attacked by them. He didn't know he was set up, but it was my... I, I, I did it to him. Anyway, he was in shock that both the workers and the bosses were attacking him. Sitting on his own at the pub afterwards, I went up to keep... I felt sorry for him, you know, joining for some company. And he finally said to me, look, you're an economist... Help me convert these people. <clears throat> I didn't, obviously. <laughs> okay. Paul. Yes. Yeah, Paul. Let's hear from you. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, very interesting um, talk. Lots of things to think about. A couple of economic questions, and then I'll talk a bit about the science, the speed of climate change, it's, you know, it's always happening faster than expected. According to scientists, well, that means the scientists are expecting the wrong thing. They don't have a good handle on it. But in terms of economics, I've always wondered why um, economists are so addicted to uh, the GDP measure. You know, when we get extreme weather events, uh, say floods in a city or massive superstorms, destroying, you know, trashing much of a city, GDP actually goes up because there's a lot of economic activity to rebuild. So does this mean to economists who like GDP going up that these storms are a good thing to happen? Um, also, um, I, I really liked the Stern report a number of years ago, which was an economic analysis on how much climate change would affect economies. And it all comes down to um, the value that you give to people living in the future you know, people that haven't been born yet. What do you place a value on them? How do you compare their value to the value of a person living today? And, you know, we're behaving as if the value of people living in the future is zero. We're not giving them any value whatsoever. And therefore, you know, one of the big moral and ethical questions is, you know, what we're doing right now is giving people uh, that would have lived in the future, you know, no, no hope or no chance. 
Um, in terms of the climate front, of course, you know, the Arctic warming is, you know, four to eight times faster than the global average. So the, the temperature gradient between the equator and the pole is much reduced and the jet streams slow down and become much wavier. You see severity and duration of extreme weather events around the planet. And this is uh, going to very soon hit our global food supply and mm. uh, cause price spikes, et cetera. I mean, that's just, it's just a matter of time. I, I think it's a sure thing. I mean, we're not stopping it, but not only are the jet streams slowing and becoming wavier, but as you mentioned in the CNBC um, interview, the center of cold in the Arctic is actually shifting with the loss of sea yeah. ice. It'll shift down to the middle of Greenland and therefore it will cause, you know, we'll have an unrecognizable uh, system in terms of weather patterns. So, you know, how we grow crops, et cetera. And, you know, the economist view that, you know, as long as you have a roof over your head, you're fine. Well, many people now that we're seeing are losing the roofs over their heads. So, so mm -hmm. the whole, um, yeah, it, it, it's a joke with the economists, but I will also say that the same sort of modeling, the same ridiculous assumptions in economic models are also being done in many climate models. Um, and, uh, you know, what we need to rely a lot more on is paleoclimate uh, data. So data from mm, ice yeah. cores, marine cores, et cetera, which show how quickly the planet changed in temperature, you know, in short periods of time on, at many different occasions in, 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 the, in the deep past. And those things were at risk of, um, we, we probably reignited a number of these so-called tipping points and uh, yeah, we're in for a rough ride. So, you know, it's, I guess it's, do you think that the neoclassical economists will suddenly change their tune and say, oh, we were wrong or they'll just get deeper and deeper into, into craziness? Deeper and deeper into craziness, Paul. By the way, the, um, the uh, center of the ship calls me to go in this thing I picked up from you. So thank you very much for that. I wasn't aware of it before, but it makes obvious sense. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, they've got, they, they, they will not admit they're wrong. Uh, they'll actually say that they warned us about this. Okay. The bastards will just come out and say, oh, we told you had to do something or you should have followed our argument for a carbon tax. You know, if you put a, a $32 carbon tax 14 years ago, this wouldn't be happening. That's the sort of garbage they're going to come up with. They will not, will not concede. Uh, it's just again, I was thinking about them as a religious cult makes far more sense than thinking about them as a science. So just like you know, somebody believes there's going to be a meteor that kills all the non-believers, the meteor doesn't arrive, and the next day the meteor is going to arrive another three years later, et cetera, et cetera. Think about that sort of thing. That's what they're going to do. And the, uh, what what I the one reason I'm trying to get this stuff published as soon as I can before the crisis hits is I want to have it in print and to get some policies to re realize you shouldn't listen to these idiots. Uh, because what happened after the global financial crisis, I mean, I was warning about that from, from 2006 on, and it happened caused by the factors that I spoke about, which is a collapse in credit-based demand. Credit-based demand depends upon the concept called, it's called endogenous money, but I call it bank-originated money and debt. And I've done the mathematics and the modelling of that since the crisis hit. Uh, who they give a Nobel Prize to? Ben Bernanke. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Who believes in loanable funds where banks are simply intermediaries? So they won't change. And they did. I think. Think a, a lot of neural uh, thinking is is a good reason as why. Once your brain is wired that way, you're not going to unwire it. Max Planck found he couldn't convert his Maxwellian colleagues to quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, the, the history of science is is actually a bit of a, an out for economists because it's normal to defend your paradigm when you strike an anomaly, and they will do that. Uh, and there's no point in trying to get them to do the right work. You simply have to get rid of them. So I'm in favour of universal basic income, so that we can give economists the incomes so that they can get off the, they can they can stop teaching at university and get off the streets. Um, that's just, just retire them. They're going to be useless, and they'll yeah. be they'll be opponents all the way through. They won't they won't at any stage come on and be helpful. So keep them out. That is uh, with, the with, best with, and funniest <laughs> rationale for universal basic income I've ever heard. There you go. <laughs> Get the professors to retire. Yeah, that's right. The ones we don't want were the economists. You know, that's.
they can do something economic beneficial by spending their money onto the GDP measure, Paul, and why they're addicted to it. Funnily enough, the data I showed you a while ago with the link between energy and GDP is a reasonable confirmation that um, there's something realistic to GDP, okay? Uh, but yes, uh, one of my friends, in Jeff Davies, an Australian biologist who's into uh, climate change modelling and so on, Jeff once said that economics is the only discipline which adds up their assets and liabilities and calls it income. And that's true. You'd normally want to be deducting things from GDP. So car accidents and ambulances should be deducted from GDP. But fundamentally, because they're all driven by energy, they add to GDP. So um, yeah, we we should we we I don't think we can do it by reforming the economic measure. We have to reform what we think humans are here on the planet for. And my overall perspective is when we if we get through this, and I'm very much in the if case as to whether we survive as a species. I'm certainly in an if case of whether civilization survives. But if we do get through this in a sort of Star Trek way and come out 200 years later with a with a revived, reformed civilization, we have to regard ourselves as the guardians of life on Earth. That's got to be the first principle and capitalism and everything else comes second and third and fourth place to being guardians of life. Definitely. So thinking about a transition strategy that can take us from where we are now into a, a stable Earth system, one of, the, one of the big challenges is, I suppose, the sunk costs of the fossil fuel energy system and yeah. the, uh, the path um, away from that. And it, it seems to me that uh, it's going to be quite slow uh, oh, yeah. uh, cutting uh, fossil fuel use. And so in the interim, we need to have a focus on direct cooling of the planet. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, uh, so I think you're probably right that economists are so ideological that they can't be changed. But if the commercial mm. interests of the fossil fuel industry uh, are seen to be uh, to align with uh, for example, refreezing the Arctic. I mean, that's a big ask. But yeah. uh, if they if they did come round to a view like that, then it, like is is that a uh, a positive uh, uh, to uh, uh, to consider? Like at at the moment, the climate um, action community is premised on the idea that the most important thing is to shut down fossil fuel industries. Mm, mm. But but if the reality is that shutting down fossil fuel industries wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't work and it wouldn't um, protect the climate, then maybe working with the fossil fuel industries to uh, increase planetary albedo, that it's, uh, it's, it's another way of thinking that I, uh, I yeah. can see Ray is shaking her head, but I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thoughts, but, Steve. Okay, <laughs> it's absolutely a no, but. Well, I've got to come in with a, I've got to come in with a maybe there, um, yeah. because <laughs> well, let me finish. Let me finish, uh, because we are. I mean, if we actually go from fossil the energy system we have right now to only renewables and nuclear, uh, then that means about an eighty percent fall in energy, and we're going to face that anyway. But that would be devastating, and uh, I mean terrifying for most people. Um, like I'm in Europe right now, and with Europe actually managed to evade the energy impact of the Ukraine war by having by global warming because it was so warm until two days ago that you didn't need to turn your heater on. Now you got to turn it on, and people uh, were starting to run down those gas and oil reserves pretty rapidly. Uh, but it, if you told people they've got to suffer an 80% fall in their income standards, then you're going to get political opposition galore. And that's going to happen anyway, okay? And my, my real fear is a Mad Max outcome for where we end up. But I want to find some way to hang on to... You know, it, 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 there's so much we've learned through the fossil fuel period. It's remarkable, the knowledge we have about the, the universe now. My big fear is losing that knowledge, frankly, and ending up with a society which is anti-technology. And uh, we go back to a primitive, uh, a primitive uh, culture. That's that's quite a feasible outcome. So I'm trying to find a way to hang on to something of an organised human society through the whole process. Now that may involve saying, okay, we're going to reduce uh, fossil fuel from 80% to 0% over 10 years. Uh, that is going to involve a government spending, but be a, a massive amount of spending by the fossil fuel companies to do it. While you do it, you've got to also help us finance and and and, and do the logistics. So the, the, the physical logistic of getting mirrors on the Arctic is huge. Um, the fossil fuel companies, to some extent, have some of the technology you need to do that. 
So I can see, okay, Raya. <laughs> I'm getting the body. Well, no, there's, there's, there. there's just, there's a lot to say, but what I think that I, I want, yeah. I mean, I, I may not agree with, you know, some of the ideas of what we can change too, but I just really want to encourage folks to, you know, what was, what I think, I agree, Stephen, that the, what was the real evil at heart here was this, this ideal log, you know, this zealotry that mm. closed off perspectives. And as much as the neoclassical economists are zealots, you know, it, it, it resist that type of zealotry. Yes, you know, they're, 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 I understand this is a mirror talk and people feel very um, strongly about this technology, but I ask that people decouple the idea of the need to investigate technologies with this, with a kind of extremism that seems to think that we can get away from addressing fossil fuel burning and get out of this climate crisis. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> I, think I we can. That... No, no, I don't, totally don't, don't think we can do that. I think what we've got to do is say, how fast can we do it? Yeah. And like, I, I, if we do it too quickly, society could collapse. And then we're in Mad Max, and then it's going to be, you know, the, the Nigerian events you see with people breaking oil, and, you know, the, it'd be chaos, and we'll end up with even more carbon. We, well, to, I, to, to, I, I also, I hear, I also say it because, the, you know, just we talk about carbon capture and sequestration and these other technologies that are yeah. marketing ideas from the fossil fuel industry to get more investment mm. to do things that they know aren't going to work. And so yeah. I just, again, take great care in seeing this, that body as an ally for a solution. Oh, yeah, they're not an ally. Also... <laughs> they're they're, they're, not, anyway. they're not an ally, but yeah, they're not an ally. No doubt about that. Yeah, and you've got so to be I politically just... dominant. OK, I mean, they've. they've the, the, the economists have helped them. I've, I've described economists as the arms merchants of climate denial because they've provided the ammunition, the arguments that have enabled the, the climate deniers to make the shitty cases they have and talk about carbon sequestration and nonsense like that, which we, we know is not, not capable of working. Um, so they're the enemy, okay? But they're enemy with the resources. They're enemy with the staff. They're enemy with the machines. And for some time, we're going to need that machinery. So... In that sense, we need to take over. Okay. Don't forget the the I, money that's being spent on the military, like for for yeah, example, yeah. the U.S. military. I mean, let's spend that. Let's take all that U.S. military budget and say, okay, we're in a climate emergency, so we're not going to build any new, design any new ways to kill people. We have enough ways already. Let's yeah. spend uh, that money, you know, for a few years on on the climate emergency. And that same thing, that same story applies there. They, they, yeah. If you particularly going to have to enforce rationing, you're going to need the military for that alone, let alone for laying mirrors. And if you had the army laying mirrors in the Arctic, that'd be much more suitable than, you know, setting up walls in Afghanistan and so on. So it's a case of you've used the resources you've got and we haven't got the resources. We're the minority, we're the outsiders. But you have to be prepared to become dominant and then you use the facilities that exist to say this is, this is the program we're working on. And obviously the military is a huge part of that. And we have a question that's come in from the audience um, regarding a little bit of what you just spoke. So I want to thank the three of you so much for coming on to um, interact and ask some questions. And I want to ask you, Steve, if you have a little more time uh, for some questions from yeah, our sure. general yeah. audience. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have a question and you haven't sent it in, you can send that to Barbara Sneath in the chat. And yeah, our first question is from Jonathan. Is there a sizable group of economists who stand up to the mainstream about these issues? And one that maybe we could align, you know, people can align um, with or th that all who also are aligned with our goals to survive and have, you know, a livable world. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. There's a, a, about, I'd say about one in six economists are non-neoclassical. Okay. That's the result using a French survey where the French have got a very top-down system. So you get out, when you get a PhD, you get allocated to a particular university to be an economist or a physicist, et cetera, et cetera. So we know there were 1,800 economists in France in roughly 2000, and 300 of them voted to form a new group, which is called uh, the Society of Appalled Economists, and they were going to be non-neoclassical, and they got blocked by a neoclassical Nobel Prize holder, a French one, obviously. So that's about one in six. 
half of them are historians, say one in, one in 10 would be a rough ratio, and most of them are post-Keynesian. So the group, group that calls themselves post-Keynesian economists, they're the ones who'd be allies. Again, most of them aren't aware of just how bad this neoclassical nonsense is. And again, like most of them, when I um, started doing this research, I said, don't bother, Steve, he's going to find it's the high discount rate. That's what I thought I'd find. Well, it wasn't the high discount rate. Onto the, we actually got asked the discount rate question earlier, by the way, so I'll elaborate on that one. Um, the reason they put the high discount is because they, they're they effectively saying it's cost benefit, cost and benefits in the future. We've got to discount them back now to put them in current dollar terms. Now, of course, that is where the intergenerational nonsense comes from, because normally that's talking about what's the benefit of turning an area of forest inside a, a city into a, um, a theme park. You know, what dollars do you get out of one, what dollars out of the other? That sort of thinking. It's not at the scale of, you know, uh, the existential issues of climate change versus no climate change, but that's how they've applied it. And they've used the discount rates that they use for, you know, micro stuff over whether you turn a, a, a native uh, forest into a, a theme park. Um, they've used that for the climate change and justified really high rates, like 7% discount rates, four, four to 7% discount rates. Um, the reason they did that is not because of intergenerational stuff. It's because, according to Nordhausen, and this is pretty much a quote, the ro role of the high discount rate is to make sure that the damages in the in the in two or three hundred years hence in the indefinite future <clears throat> don't overwhelm the quote unquote relatively small damages in the next one or two centuries. So it's playing a mathematical mothing up role. That's what they actually use the high discount rates for. Now, again, working with Brian Handley, I mentioned earlier, the one who identified the NOA a database to me. Brian made the point, and I then did proof, that a discount rate is something you apply to benefits in the future, net benefits, because your danger is your net benefits will be lower than you expect, so you put a discount rate for uncertainty as well as for time value of money. But when you apply it to damages, your discount rate should be negative. And what that means is the negative counteracts the positive and you actually should use no discount rate. So there's a good argument to have no discount rate at all on this stuff. And it isn't really the intergenerational stuff. I think it's going to happen to our generation. It'll certainly happen to my nieces and nephews. So we should get away from the whole point that it's about intergenerational equity. It's about survival. It's not intergenerational, it's our generation. We do have another question. It's a question from Don. Do neoclassicals include the true cost of energy use in their cost of energy, the health and welfare damages? No, they didn't even include an energy period. Okay. Energy, I mean, Nordhaus actually says in his manual for DOS uh, that the production function involves labor, capital, and energy. It doesn't. It's got labor and capital. That's it. There's no role for energy in his production function. They're not even in the they're not even. You're wondering whether they're they're they're, they're you know what what dance they're doing. They're not even in the ballroom. Yeah. Um. Just, John North has got a question about radically shifting undergrad and undergraduate curriculum away from neoclassical models. I, I think to say the we just get the engineers and the biologists and the and the physicists to take over teaching economics, delegitimize uh, economics having a monopoly in economics. Mm -hmm. That's that's but that's going to be. I mean. You know, we're not going to do it. We have to get our alternative methods as well, which is why I'm teaching system dynamics these days as much as I can to say that's what we should be using. Throw all this methodology out, teach people who do economic system dynamics, and they'll end up with the limits to growth. Mm -hmm. And John is asking, how can we persuade fossil fuel companies that refreezing the Arctic is actually in their best interest because the damage from tipping points will be so catastrophic for everybody? I'm good. hoping that one of the one of the first major things wipes out a couple of uh, sh shipping uh, uh, shipping ports. You know, mm. if you've seen um, if you've seen the, uh, the what's his name, um, uh, Jim James Hansen's 2016 paper, it's a thing using paleo uh, the data. Paul um, said that when I think of the Amian period, the last time we had the AMOC breakdown, he said the storms on the North Atlantic generated waves of 45 meters. Mm. Now. If waves like that start hitting some of our ports, then hopefully a couple of uh, of oil of, of refineries are going to go uh, go up in in water rather than smoke, and then they'll realise this is you know stop laughing, this is serious. But I don't think they're going to do anything until we actually get to that stage of you know catastrophic damages. 
Yeah. Uh, and once it happens, then we've got to say, you know, you are being taken over. Here's a question from Bernard. Could it be interesting to establish economic incentives for people to produce their own energy from solar and wind to reduce their energy use and to sequester carbon in their own environments? I think that's reasonable. I think it's a reasonable thing to do. But again, avoid putting it all on people, individual people. Um, you know, this is this is part of the carbon footprint stuff that's being used to say it's all your fault. You shouldn't have bought that extra Mars bar. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's actually the production system that locks you into this, and there's very little individual can do when you're in a production system dominated by a technology that uh, you know the oil and gas companies have put down themselves. So yes, we we need to assist people so that they can do that. I think that's a very good concept, but we have to keep the focus on the systemic stuff that's got us into this problem in the first place, and the systemic stuff that might enable us to survive it, which is where Mir comes in. Yeah. Well, our last question is from somebody kind of just getting your opinion. <laughs> um, and it's a question about Mir. Do you think Mir should accept funding from billionaires? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You, you, say? Money, you, you, you should be getting money from the government. And this is one of the points. The government can create money. We, we don't have a shortage of money. We have a shortage of resources. Uh, money can be created by banks by creating loans, and that's what's given us the financial bubbles and, and crises. The government can create the money as well. So yes, if a billion is willing to donate, get it, okay? Um, but you've got to say, okay, we, you're, you're, you're giving you're the giving money to us unconditionally. Okay? You don't want to get caught up in conditions and compromises. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming, Steve, onto a mirror talk. And it's just been really enlightening. And what a good title. <laughs> Appalling <laughs> what we've learned. But um, thank you. And if anybody wants to revisit this, we do have the the mirror channel on YouTube. So great to have you with us today. Thank, thank you. And thank you for the great questions and a good audience. Thank you very much. Let's keep in touch. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, Mir, Bye. Bye now. Bye. Oh. At Mir, we are working to help educate the public while also developing a solution to the warming on the planet. And we invite you to keep learning about Earth's energy imbalance and climate science on our first principles and also FAQs um, pages. At Mir, we're an almost 100% volunteer staff with only a few paid researchers at the moment. So please consider making a monthly donation if you can of any amount. And if you have enjoyed being here and watching our Mir talks, you can go to our YouTube channel, <clears throat> which is will be pasted into to the chat right now, Mir SRM. We also have a Facebook page now, so do check that out. It's also Mir SRM. <laughs> And the donations that you make do help to fund materials and sensors for a solar reflector field experiments, basic expenses for researchers, and also adaptation equipment that is going to communities that are already adversely affected by thermal heating. So if you've found being here beneficial, then please tell somebody else about Mir. And we do hope to see you next month, um, January 5th in the new year. So thanks again for coming and hope to see you in January. Bye for now.